cheers to another episode of the Wine Notes Podcast. I'm your guide, AJ Weinzettel, on this journey of stories showcasing the people behind the wonderful world of wine, where we dive into conversations ranging from terroir, viticulture, to favorite music, superpowers, and more. Please enjoy this episode of the Wine Notes Podcast. Grant, Renee, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. We're well, so pleased. Yeah, we're stoked to be here. Yeah, well, we're I, here in our place. I'm I'm definitely stoked to be here. (laughs) Uh, I know that we were trying to do this last week, but with the ice storm and everything, holy Toledo, that was crazy. Indeed. It was. It was very icy. Uh, Extreme. It got down to 13 degrees at our house, which is the coldest it's ever been since I've lived here, since 2006. And talking to some people that have lived there here their whole life and it's the coldest they've seen too i've i've been here since 2001 and i don't remember it being this cold either yeah yeah it, it was we're in a time of extremes yep i would agree shall i pour us a little bit of wine Ooh, sure a little bit do. of blind wine all right i mean it's never too early in the morning is it <laughs> <laughs> never too early i mean it's just a teeny bit it's not too much no oh um, so as i always tell everybody you know talk about it whatever you want um no pressure but I, uh, you know, I always try to find some sort of connection. I don't know if I did a good connection on this one or not. Okay. <laughs> so we'll we'll see. Uh, but again, you know, please feel free to enjoy and whatever you want to say. Just you know, uh, the floor is yours to whatever you want to say about it. Hmm. That's my opening remark. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Wait a minute. Oh. And yes, I uh, I did not get this to room temperature. It's, so it's it's a little it's a little cold, but okay. it's not it's not too too bad. We've been uh, we started watching this show called Drops of God, mm. and we, we're a couple episodes in, and it's it's relevant because we're watching it with like our daughter. I think our son has taken no interest in it. And he's in, but our daughter, and it's kind of. It's relevant because obviously it's it's female based and it's a, a father son. And we're hoping that do- she's the heir to the hundred sons. May, maybe you know, <laughs> we sometimes. Yes. That. But she actually like she enjoys it, you know, and she she'll smell it. the wines. And like last night, she was sitting there, and um, a friend of ours had brought over some Underberg. Do you know what that is? They're like little. It's like frenet. Okay. You know, it's like a digestive, um, and they're just full of like botanicals. So it comes in these tiny little bottles. Um, and so she's like, what is that, Dad? And I was like, it's Underberg. And she's like, and I'm like, I don't particularly care for it. I don't like Frenette either. But so we opened it up and then she smelled it and then she dipped a toothpick into it and then she tried it and she was like, she went through, she got cinnamon and she got clove and like all these like- Licorice. Licorice and it's, it's wow. super That's why we say powerful. Grooming her. Yeah. Yes. And, I, yes. and it was the like- future winemaker. It was. It's pretty cool. <laughs> that is she, really cool. Yeah. yeah, she's pretty. She's pretty good at it. Yeah. She probably have things more to say about this. Than she me. would. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that is fair. I, and I loved watching Drops of God. Uh, normally, when I watch TV, I am multitasking. So I'm, you know, coding, mm-hmm. having a glass of wine, and watching TV. Right. And that is just something that with. Uh, it was French, Japanese, and English. Yeah, you got to pay attention. Yeah, definitely have to pay attention. Yeah, but yeah, it's I really enjoyed it. So far, we're only a little bit into it, but it's yeah. it's enjoyable. Yeah, it is good. Okay, well, um, aromatically, it's um, it's pretty tight and focused. There's not a lot of fruit. I got a little kiss of wood initially, not a ton, just a little bit of you know, kind of. Maybe marshmallow brown sugar. And then there's sort of, there's a very cool climate character underneath mm-hmm. it. There's a, a little bit of tomato leaf. Um, there's some sort of pepper. I mean like a white peppery yeah. to it. Yeah, it almost, it mm-hmm. reminds me of, uh, you know it reminds me of is 2017 uh, Gamay from um, uh, Pray Tell. That white pepper note. That oh yeah, oh. so much. Yeah. Or that's like the yeah. 19s, 19, 19, Sorry, nineteen yeah. It wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Evans it, too. Are, are, are all of all of for whatever reason that vintage all nineteen from that yeah. all that white pepper in those yeah. gamays. Yeah. Uh, 
I feel you on that. You think it's got a little bit of age on it? It looks like it. Yeah. It's got it's the colors waning a little bit. And, um, it could be that it was over vintaged in barrel, you know, for an additional six months, and that can do the trick as well. Uh, it could be Oregon Pinot. It could be Oregon um, Gamay. I think it's Pinot. I think it's got a few years, like mm -hmm. maybe 17. Cool, a cooler vintage. It's got some restraint to it. I get that tomato leaf. Should we wait? Should we tell fruit. you what we think now what it is? Or should we wait till the end? How that is totally up to you. Oh, tell us now what you think it is. And then you can say later I don't later have anything on. more definitive than that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it seems... Oh, man, that's a tough one. If it's 19, it doesn't seem like 19 to me. It almost seems a little older than I that. I think it's older than a 19. Yeah. Oh, like 19, 18, 16. 16. That's why I said 17. <laughs> 16 would have been... It doesn't taste like a 16 to me. Those are a little bit more... Those are much bigger. It, it, we're assuming this is Oregon, too. We are which we could Oregon. be way off base. It, it's probably that. safe to assume safe it's to Oregon. Assume. Okay. Safe to assume. Yeah. Um, I think it could also be a well-made 13. 15 or 17. Sticking with that. 15? <laughs> <laughs> 15 was hot. And those wines had a... They had a... Um, they were sappy. That's they true. They were quite. There was a. There was alcohol. There was richness. That was the second year in a row after, you know, after it was still kind of cooler. Right. And then we had fourteen, and then fifteen, and we were sort of reeling. I think we learned a lot from fourteen. By the time we got to fifteen, fifteen we, was our first vintage here, though. Yeah. I guess that's the only, the only context I have for it. I'm gonna go with twenty thirteen. Uh, and I think it is, oh, I'm going to go marine sedimentary soil, um, although it does sort of taste like very Evesham woody. Um, yeah, I'm going to go 13 Pinot, okay. Oregon. Okay. That's cool. And all right. feel free to change your mind when okay. we get to the end. All right. All right. All right. Oh. Uh, one of the things I love about doing these interviews is diving into stories uh -huh. and your stories. And it's always difficult to find a place to start, mm -hmm. right? But this one was like, hands down, this is easy, huh. right? So um, I, I'm curious, right? Should we start with um, talking about Sandy the Well from the Natural History Museum? <laughs> <laughs> or try to figure out who has a better impression of Dr. Poole, the oh dentist. Oh, God. Our dentist the, the is two. legendary, <laughs> man. Legendary. All right, you go. First impression. Uh, Dr. Poole. Doctor. Oh, it's like a humming <laughs> while working. <laughs> That's what it is. You're much yeah. better at the impression than I am. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, yeah. you know, we had the same childhood dentist growing up. And so when we went on our first date and realized, you know, we, we knew we had grown up in the same hometown. Right. And so that first date where we were really kind of going back through the memory bank of growing up in, you know, little Monterey, California town. Um, it was really fun, I think, to connect over the little details about like the cat posters hanging on the ceiling of Dr. Poole's office. And oh my gosh. Grant did oh. this. <laughs> yeah. Grant did his Dr. Poole impression. I was like, this guy's great. He's funny. <laughs> we have this shared history together. Right. Um, and then argued about who owned more of this natural history whale than, you know, than the other person. Um, but that, that shared history continues to really root us um, in what we're doing. And our, our families are both still, our parents are both still living in, in within a mile of each other. Yeah. Wow. Um, and I think having that, having that understanding of place and where we come from has, has been a really special part of our relationship. It has. I, I totally agree. And you, you don't even realize how important it is that, that sense of connection till you actually, you, you get on in life and you have children and we're obviously building a business together and making wine and doing all the things. But 
it is pretty special because not only do do we have that shared context, but so do our f- parents and my sister and her brother. So we're both uh, have I have an older sister. She has an older brother. Right. So we're kind of the second kids, but we both grew up in this Monterey Peninsula area. So we have a lot of shared history, shared stories. So it, the whole family is is kind of conjoined. And, mm-hmm. and my sister lives up here now. Okay. After she um, she left have California. You never met her? I don't know. I don't think I've ever met oh, Kate. They have yeah. Right. Kill deer distilling. Okay. Yeah. Up on okay. Ribbon Ridge. I probably have. Yeah. 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 I probably have. And so they both kind of migrated up here, and you know his parents are they they got a distiller and a winemaker, mm-hmm. and they couldn't be happier about it. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I have to be sure to email her and or interview her. Yeah. And, yeah. and ask like okay. So when you sent Grant the email saying that Renee was single, what what, what did you tell him? Oh, oh she no. read the email at our wedding, I think. She did, yes. Oh, wow. She had emailed Grant to say, you know. Yeah, I'll never forget that. Well, I remember very distinctly that I I was working a harvest in Australia in 2004, I think it was oh That's yeah it was oh four it was oh four so i was over on the west coast in margaret river and i had made some friends working at a previous internship in in the bay area and um so i was over there it was perfect the friend that i was living with uh ty was uh, a surfer as well and so we were surfing and working and it was a lot of fun and i i you know i assumed that i was going to come home but at that point i had no path really like i could have stayed in australia i could have done anything if you know, i would have probably travel a little bit more but then Kate sent me that message letting me know that Renee was was you know available to ask out on a date not that she you knew that no I didn't know that this uh, was going on so then I you know I hustled back home and, and got a job nearby so I could ask her out wait a minute you got in a motorbike accident and then you had to come home I, I mean let's be honest <laughs> about the you got in an accident and came home with like a brain bleeding no but I had I and had then- the <laughs> ticket my ticket and my inter- I had the internship set up I was going to work at Testarossa uh, in the Los Gatos area because I knew that she lived in the Bay Area. I didn't really know exactly where, but it turns out Walnut Creek, which was pretty close by. So um, I'd gotten that job at Testarossa, and then I was doing some traveling, yes, and then I, I, I ended up flying off the road on a moped in the middle of a rainstorm way high up in the mountains near Chiang Mai, and I, I hurt my head. <laughs> Ouch. Anyways, I made it home. I had some some minor brain issues. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Fully recovered. Fully, re- as far as I know, uh, and and then yeah, I got you know got on the job at Testarossa, and uh, then not too shortly after that, I think I invited you on a date. Uh, well, Kate sort of said, my sister said, you know, Grant's in the Bay Area, and he's sort of friendless and. And you know, could maybe you guys could hang out? And so yeah, she gave me a real sob story. Yeah, <laughs> and so we leaned pretty hard into that. And then I took her. I had previously worked at a winery in Alameda called Rosenblum, a big Zinfandel house, and they right. did. They were kind of the archetype of the sort of big California wines of the of the late '90s, early 2000s. And so they used to have these pretty epic open houses right on Alameda near um, uh, Oakland. And they would pour like 20 wines Holy and cow. they were all in you know, 14 and a half was considered low alcohol. Jeez. And, and so, so anyways, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> we had a great time and, and, and we, that was the first date. That was, it was a wine, a wine soaked, wine yeah. soaked adventure, which it should was. have given me an indication of what was to come. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I thought maybe Peppers was your first date or something. No. Peppers we Peppers is like our place in Monterey where we have to go and have margaritas there, though, every single time. We just came back from Christmas, and we had multiple margaritas. I do that's love our, that place That's so our much. favorite spot, yeah. Yeah, it, is, it has that hometown feel to it. You know, it's right next to Sandy the Whale, right down from Lovers of, Lovers of Jesus Point uh, in Pacific Grove. Mm-hmm. Everybody calls it Lovers Point, but it's actually Lovers of Jesus Point. Okay. And, uh, and then... The little known facts of Pacific Grove, and it's just an epic place to grow up. Yeah, that, it sounds yeah. like it. it I mean, ironically, there's of course there's wine there, you right. know. So our parents are still baffled why 
we've come here. I think they understand it now. They've been visiting us now enough to, to realize that this is a special place to be a producer, I think. And at the very beginning, when you when we had first met and you were done with your internship and you realized it was time to just sort of like plant your feet somewhere, there was a lot of conversation about where that would be, whether we would stay in California and do it, whether we would go, move down to somewhere like Paso or, you know, Lodi or Mendo Coast or, you know, we kind of batted around a lot of ideas. Um, but at the end of the day, the idea of coming to Oregon, I mean, it's kind of funny because you came up here to take a job with Eric Homaker, who also had roots in Monterey. Mm -hmm. So they had that as a touch point too. And okay. it might be one of the reasons why you got that first job with Eric. But, you know, we, we really ended up deciding that even though we came up here and Grant spent 10 years, you know, making wine at Beaufort and with Homaker, always knew that the, at the end goal was to have a project of our own and doing that in Oregon seemed more doable. Right. And we were chasing, I mean, I think you came up chasing Pinot Noir ultimately. I did. But I, I think when I was trying to first figure out where I wanted to go, I always gravitated towards the fringes. I never wanted to go necessarily to Napa or Sonoma in California. And at that particular point, um, in the early to mid 2000s, it was, uh, it was a scene that you kind of had to know people at certain levels to kind of move your way up the chain. And I was very much at the bottom. Right. And there was more opportunity in the fringes. So, you know, I thought of places like, you said Paso and I remember borrowing her car because it was more reliable than mine. She had this Nissan Xterra. And I took a stack of resumes and I remember driving around, I think it was down in the Central Coast area, kind of near Slow County, and and just passing out resumes and talking. And I remember cold calling wineries, you know, just to see if anybody had positions open. And I, I had a, a lot of people that just kind of said no and hung up the phone or don't bother me kind of thing. And I remember there was a there was very there was a couple people that were just like so cool. One of the guys that was the coolest was this guy Clay. I forget his last name, and he was the winemaker Zaka Mesa at the time down in <clears throat> Paso area. And he said, "Look, I don't have a job, but if you want to come by and chat, I'm, I'm, my door is open." And I remember he was very cool, calm character, and he just kind of talked to me and told me stories and and maybe what I should do. And and he was just like such an open and nice guy. And it's always kind of informed me to the future, like you know, when somebody walks in with a resume in hand and I, I, we don't have a job, at least I can help and right. push them mm -hmm. in the right direction. But we, um, I applied for a few jobs and I, I remember getting uh, a job offer couple job offers. One of them was up in Washington. Um, that was not a good fit. And then I remember um, there was another winery in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and they were like, look, we need an assistant winemaker, and you would, you seem like you'd be great. So I was kind of toying with that, and then I had sent a, a, a resume in, a blind resume to a winery in Oregon. Right. And then I got a call from Eric Homaker, and it, it was right as I was about to accept that other job. He said, look, come on up. I'll fly you up here. Let's chat. And so I did and flew up here and I had not been up to Oregon since my sister went to U of O for one year. So I kind of knew Eugene area, but I'd never been north of that. Uh, and met at the airport uh, or got, rented a car and then I met Eric and then he picked me up with his wife, Louisa Ponzi. Okay. Uh, and they got in the car and they we drove around to vineyards. We went and visited Betty Wall's Vineyard, which is a... Uh, at the out in Yamhill Carlton, yeah, old yeah. vineyard, own rooted, been around for a long time, and they introduced me to Betty Wall. Um, they were negotiating fruit contracts, and we got back in the car, and then we drove around, had lunch, and then they showed me the studio. And at the time, they they were co-owners of the studio, the Carlton Winemakers. Studio. Uh, yeah, sorry, Carlton yeah. Winemakers yeah. Studio. Yeah. And then uh, you know, the next day, I think the day after, or so he offered me the job, and I came back and I said, hey you know, do you, you, you want to go? And she was like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So she, we've been dating for like three months or something like that. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. Very well, I mean, it was pretty quick. It yeah. was, it was pretty quick. I don't even it, know was, how many months yeah. it was, but it was yeah. very quick. You moved up here and I was teaching high school at the time. And so I waited and then came when that was all over. Yeah. But he was living in a, in a little 
house that Stuart and Athena Bodecker had in Carlton. Yep. Um, this like little rental house in Carlton. Right. And Carlton back then, man, it was it was pretty quiet. I can imagine. You know, it was different. It was a different world, kind of. It hadn't Very much. quite. It hadn't become what it is now. Nope. Um, yeah, and you went up there and lived in in the Bodecker's house until we. Yeah, I, sh- I shared it with Ray Walsh. was a was a roommate. Ray Walsh, he was a longtime winemaker at King Estates, and then he started his own wine recall Capitello. And then he had he was he was kind of ahead of his time. He was the winemaker for a pretty ambitious sparkling project called Merryweather. Yep. And which everybody and their brothers making amazing sparkling wine up here, but he was like kind of doing it. There was like Argyle and him, and right. he was making these amazing sparkling wines. Um, but that kind of fell off, and so. I had a shared have you, space with him. Have you heard that that's going to probably get re? re I had heard little little buzzings yeah. in the world. Yeah, um, well, I hope he does. Yeah, but well, it's it's it won't be him. Oh, it won't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Somebody else has bought the IP for oh, it. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I had I had heard, and that's great because that Carlton Winemaker Studio <sighs> actually. Sorry, I didn't inter- interrupt no. you. No, it was that was a great place for you to land, and and I didn't have a teaching credential when I moved up here and so I ended up working to harvest with Patrick Reuter up there for Dominion 4 right and so when we first came here when I, the, the minute I moved here that summer I you know kind of got gathered myself together and then we started doing this harvest out in Carlton together mm-hmm. and so that was the first taste of production that I'd had but at the studio at that time you know Andrew Rich Kelly Fox the Bodeckers, Lynn and Ron Penrash had just left there yeah. not too long before Ray Walsh was there. It was kind of an incredible place to ground ourselves in Oregon wine community yeah. in a way that was much less isolating than it would have been if you had taken a job as an assistant in somebody's cellar and just been like sequestered in. Right. So it was sort of the right. best thing that could have ever happened to us moving up here from nowhere. I, I can imagine um, it was. And a lot of those friendships that we have from the Carlton Winemaker Studio early days are, you know, still really, really close to us. Well, we were just chatting with Eric Homaker uh, day before yesterday at Terry Castile's um, memorial, and. Uh, and he was talking about Carlo and Matteo, who are going off to college. And when I got the job, Luisa was pregnant with Car- Carlo and Matteo. Yeah, it just seems. Impossible. And I was like, we were both sort of looking <laughs> at each other, like, "Wow, it's gone by quickly," uh, and it really has. But it's very true. Like, I was very green uh, when I stepped foot into that studio, and because Luisa was pregnant with twins, um, and Eric had a lot going on, he was consulting for a couple projects. He really kind of put me in this position and said, okay, go. Uh, and so a lot of times he wasn't around. And if I had questions, I definitely leaned on a lot of the people that were making wine there. And especially Andrew Rich took me under his wing and really helped me negotiate, and navigate. And um, at the time there was kind of changing of the guard in terms of the general management and all that stuff. but. At the end of the day, uh, I we made some lifelong friends coming out of that place. You know, right. Andrew's still a dear friend of ours. I, I can only imagine. Yeah. And just to back up a teeny bit, mm-hmm. so the two of you knew each other for about three months before you moved up to Oregon. We had mm-hmm. known each other for a couple well, of years. I'm, I'm sorry, but dating, we had been dating, dating not dating. very long. Sorry, yeah, yeah I'm in dating. Um, so was it in that three months that Uncle Bob sent you like a, a vertical uh. Beau Frere? The, like that oh, late man. 90s Beau Frere? Yeah, How wow. did that happen? Bob, so my uncle was a... I'm trying to fill in the back story for people who don't haven't got the back story. Um, that I had an uncle who was deeply into wine. Um, but, you know, for most of... Since the early 90s. and eight, Late 80s, early 90s. And as soon as... I mean, even before it was appropriate for me to drink, frankly. He was trying to get my brother and I interested in wine. Right. And so the first sort of aha moment that I had was standing in my brother's kitchen in San Francisco on Dolores Street doing a vertical of Calera wines, which I assume Steve had made, which is kind of funny now. Steve Dorner was probably the winemaker during that time, and now he's our neighbor and friend and, Mm -hmm. you know, sort of um, incredible figure here. But tasting those wines together was like an awakening for me. I can imagine. And Bob continued to send me wines that I had no right drinking um 
and he must have sent those wine. I don't know. So he had been sending me wines for a long time, but I, that that Beaufrere, I, I don't remember when that happened. Well, he was he was sending us. Uh, he was sending. I think he was clearing out some some stuff in his cellar too, because he sent us or sent you a whole bunch of old Kistler Chardonnays from the '90s, early '90s, in Durrell Vineyard and Kistler. <laughs> they were all and they were turned. all completely oxidized. <laughs> that, you know, and they were just they were. They were just they 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 should have been drank a couple years before, anyhow. So we were we had those, and then and then he knew that you had started dating me in my background. And then and then he sent out that. Is that I, when he sent it after? He sent it out after, and but I remember not way before you were ever at Beaufrere, though. Way before, way before, way, yeah. way before. before Oregon, I think. And yeah. I had never had Beaufrere, and I remember when I was I did the enology program at Fresno State, and we didn't do a lot of of Oregon wines or taste a lot of Oregon wines, but I remember tasting some Archery Summit wines that I was impressed by. Those were some of the firsts, uh, and then he sent that, and I remember we had we had. Um, we were in California, weren't we, well, when we drank we, some of those? We went up to your friend Joel's yeah, house up in We were in Nassau. Calistoga. Yeah, Calistoga. So we went up there, and I have another buddy of mine, Matt Taylor. Really, now he's become quite the famous winemaker in California. Um, he worked for Araujo, and then he Pino, and now he's working for, for um, the guy who owns uh, So we drank Hyde those both with, him. with him, yeah. I remember, when we, and he was like, he was a huge Pino head. Right. Worked in Burgundy, worked at Dujac. And he was like, what, where'd you get these? You know, I think if I remember, it was like 96, 97, 98, 99. And he was like, this is incredible. Right. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. I know it's like this winery and like Robert Parker owns part of it. That's kind of crazy. And so we drank them and they were excellent and really fun. And that was kind of an introduction to Beaufort. Never in a million years did I think I would ever work there. Right. Uh, but, and that was pre us even coming to, to yeah, Oregon. Yeah, I think that's right. It was in that short window before yeah. we got here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, can, right. I can only imagine. Yeah, um, it was pretty special. You know, and kind of talking about Tears of God earlier and like having the hair, you know, like shh, take the reins at 100 Suns or whatever. I'm just curious if 100 Suns ever gets big enough, like that second interview, are you going to have them like do an essay about the, a human? <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, you mean my interview with Mike? Yes. Oh, God. That was at a really weird time, too, because we were just, we were living in Portland still. We were living in this tiny apartment up in Portland, and you had only been at Homaker for about a year. Less than a year. Yep. It, and I then that job came heart. up, and you were like, you'll never believe this job that just came up. Well, and it was, uh, so a friend of mine, actually, Brian Irvine, he, at the time, he had, uh, he was working at Shehalem, and he was like, hey, did you see this job that came up? And, and he said something about, like, are you going to throw your hat in the ring? Um, and I said, I hadn't really thought of it, but I should. And so I did. I wrote, I wrote a, sent a resume and, and you know, sent it to, to Mike. And, and then I got a call from him a couple days later. And we chatted on the phone. He says, well, why don't you come on in for, for an interview? You know, we'll just right. have kind of a walking, talking interview. Um, so I did, and um, was that the first time you'd ever met Mike? Too, you didn't know him. No, from I'd the never. Industry or and in like fact, that. you know, you go down North Valley Road. Now there's a big sign, but back in it was 2006. It, there was no sign, no nothing. There was, right. well, there was, there was a little sign, but it was hard to see. And I zoomed right by it, and I was like, gosh, I passed it, and I had to turn around and come back, and I went up the driveway, and I rolled up to this place, and I'm like, whoa, this is very farmy. This is pretty cool. But no pigs back then either. No pigs. No pre pig. Pig. Pre-pig. 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 Or okay. there was there was pigs before, then no pigs, and now there's pigs again. But it's BP and yeah, and yeah. AP. <laughs> yeah. So I got up there and uh, you know, there's Mike on the phone talking to somebody up in this old hayloft that they turned into an office and you know, about four rifles sitting behind him um, in this broke down chair. And I was like, okay, here we are. <laughs> I and, imagine. you know, I had been going to school in the Central Valley, California, so it was, there was characters out there just similar. So I wasn't too shocking, but I was like, this is interesting. And um, so we chatted and tasted, and he talked about what he was looking for. And, yeah, and then he, he gave me an assignment, which was, you know, write, a, write an essay about something, somebody you admire. And so I wrote about my father. Um, who I love dearly and who's like a super hard worker and you know taught me a lot about working and so 
and Renee was very much pushing on me, like, because I was kind of dragging my feet, and she, so it's really her, you know, come on, Grant, like, get to it, like, write that essay, and I did, and anyways, long story short, um, and the, he, he's like, I like the essay, can I call your dad? Uh, okay, so he called my dad, um, and they had a chat, and and he says, okay, well, he gave you a thumbs up. <laughs> I would hope so. I think that is so up. funny. Yeah, of all people to call. Yeah. Like, I think my dad, I was like, what'd you say? He's like, well, he says, I like you fine. And, you know, you're a good kid. And I was like, thanks, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Something to that effect. But I think yeah. the real, really the, the, what, what sealed the deal was after that, he asked us to meet in Portland after an auction. And so he was staying up in Portland with his late wife, Jackie. And Jackie really wanted to meet the two of us. And, Cause they're really about family. And, and so she, Jackie met Renee, and I think Jackie really liked Renee a lot. Um, and I think that was also like, well, you know, you guys are, you guys are not, you're a good guy and she's amazing. And so that was, that was part of the, part of the deal. Right. Um, and so, yeah, that, then 07, I moved from Homaker over to, um, to Beaufrere and, my first job was sitting on the back of a compost spreader, spreading compost at the upper terrace. Very nice. Yeah. How much red ink did Renee put on your essay on the first draft? She edited it. Yeah, she did. That's good. I mean, yeah. some editing. Yeah, I, I, I would involved, hope so. But not. You're actually you're a great content producer. Like you, your story was there. It was really all about Parvo, which is this terrible dog <laughs> disease where they get diarrhea and about how Grant had to clean the cages, but that his dad would also clean cages if he had to or, to, or whatever they're called. Yep. Right? Yeah, yeah it was, it was it pretty was funny. True. I was a kennel boy for my dad for many years and I cleaned up a lot of bad stuff. But actually, if you think about it, it's, I mean, I think part of the essay that you wrote was about how you did not, that you were not afraid of working really hard yeah. and doing those things that, you know, you're, you were not just going to be the kind of person who wanted to prance around and love for swirling and snapping, yeah. that you were there to do the work too, which is kind of funny because, I mean, at the end of the day, here we are. And the one thing about having your own small winery is that you have to clean the kennels you know you, right. you do not get to just do the fun stuff and have white burgundy lunches you're still you know grant is still when he's here he's still topping barrels and and doing the cellar work too you too and it, yeah but i mean it's it's not that that tenant of just being willing to Get work your hands really dirty. hard yeah. to make something happen is it, it is a foundation of your your you know personality in your you know professional life for sure yeah but that's just now you know fast forward here we are uh, sitting in front of you you know uh in our own our own winery and making our own wines and yeah it's it's when you're first starting off and your job is you know vineyard winery and your head is down and and you do those jobs uh there is <laughs> You don't realize it at the time you're working so hard, but it's just, it's kind of one narrow path in a way. Whereas once you own a place, then there are so many paths oh. on a daily basis, you know, from, you know, Renee doing a compliance in New Mexico to getting ready for sales on Friday to, you know, hosting a tasting and then everything in between and swim practice afterwards. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's the fun stuff, you yeah. know. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's one of the things I have loved about watching the two of you. The, your energy is just, it's positive, it's high energy, and it's, uh, it's contagious, and it's wonderful. Oh, thank and I'm, you. You're welcome. And I'm curious, you know, so... Uncle Bob, he you know had teachings about wine, about it being a portal into companionship, community, conversation, and feeling alive. Mm -hmm. You know, did that kind of play into your ethos when you started Hundred Sons? I, I mean, I feel like you embody this in a lot of ways, in a better than I do in some cases. It's ironic because Uncle Bob himself was, and my uncle was an incredibly awkward individual who had very few close friends um, and so at the end of the day you know for him to be imparting that advice too is I guess uh, hearing you say it makes me kind of sad because I think he had that as an ideal right 
Um, but he didn't ever get to embody it in the way that I think that we are able to, in the sense that we have an incredible community of like-minded people who love wine right. um, and who love food and are anxious to share it with us. And he actually didn't. Mm. It's maybe one of the reasons he wanted so desperately for my brother and I to become wine lovers was so that he would have the people to share it with. And that's not to say he didn't have anybody, but yeah. he did have people, but not in the same way that we we do. But it is definitely for us, it's, um, it's, it is a, a way to have community right. um, and to, to have conversation for sure and to just enjoy <laughs> enjoy life with the people that we care about. Um, and the community here is like nothing else. I think you know having been just coming out of the of, of Terry Castile's ser- service like Grant was saying, you know, you realize how much um, the Oregon wine industry in general has that as a as a bedrock of this yeah. community, which is right. like, we're in this together. This is a joyful thing yeah. that we get to do. And what an honor that we get to do it in the company of all these other amazing people. Very true. And it feels still like there's a real um, gratitude on behalf of the people who are at least in the industry here. And that that value, I think, is shared across the valley, and you know. Yeah, and that was that was something that very much attracted me to it, and and thinking of you know kind of going back to like community and drinking wine and hanging out with friends. Like I remember in the early days of our relationship, you know, when we were entertain um, for us as kind of like a, a newlyweds and pre kids, you know, we would kind of try and pull out all the stops. We didn't have any money and we had very few nice bottles of wine, but we had a couple here or there and we would have friends over and we would spend all day cooking and we would it we would have a lot of fun. And we thought we had to put on a you know a a, a white tablecloth uh event every time. And right. as we've gotten older, we realize that you know as long as you have the bread and cheese and the and some, a simple meal and a few good bottles of wine, they don't have to be spectacular. That means just as much. So we've taken some of sort of the pressure off of ourselves of trying to be, you know, some, you know, gourmand, you know, because <laughs> life is, is quite busy for us yep. um, with other things outside of, of winemaking. And, but it's, for me, it's very exciting too, because I, I think of somebody again, like Uncle Bob, who had collected all of this wine and had all these ideas of sitting down and you know that he was a musician and he talked about how all he wanted to do was you know play his organ and drink aged champagne well he got cancer and he died Mm -hmm. and so all of that went away and he passed that collection down to us so we actually have a bunch of his wines that he collected over the years and we have been very much opening these wines in and in the presence of friends and family and enjoying them right. and if you actually you know talk to some people around here they're like oh is this oh, uncle they bob? all know uncle bob uncle bob <laughs> all my friends know yeah. Uncle bob. Yeah. you know and that is because we're sharing those wines with those people and they're wines that we could never have afforded right and that's pretty special that is uh and and then i was having a chat with another friend the other day and he, this person had, had started collecting wine and was sort of scratching their head. Oh, I got a lot of wine now. Maybe I should just, I don't know if I'm going to drink it all. I'm going to sell it. And, you know, like, don't sell it. Just, just enjoy it. Not in excess. And then have people over and meet new people and enjoy it with them. And that is what, at the end of the day, this is all about. It is. I completely agree. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're talking about life is busy. I mean, getting 100 sons off the ground, going to school practice, I'm curious, when was the last time y'all were able to get on the couch toe-to-toe and just tell stories about the day and just kind of relax? <laughs> Actually, the ice storm was great. Okay. I mean, yeah. you know, that's the thing, I think, is that there is always, there, is, there are so many demands. And it, there there is a thing, too, which is that when you own a business with your partner, and we're lucky that we have lots of friends who are doing the exact same thing that we are, right? that it gets really hard to draw boundaries around that your time and conversation so that when we are toe to toe to resist the temptation to talk about the business, yeah. 
is really hard. I can imagine. And we have to put do better at making boundaries around that. But during the ice storm, it was really nice because we were kind of stranded at home with our kids. And, you know, we played some Settlers of Catan and Oh, sat and on we the got that and, fire rage. We have this yeah. fireplace, a wood fireplace, and it's... I love building the fire and keeping it going, and I have it's like my new thing during the winter when it's really cold to go and check and see what the temperature of the house is, you know, because without the heat on, you know, we... we it's like even, dad pride. Yeah, it's dad pride. Like, I'm like, <laughs> we are at 70, 69, 70 degrees, and it's 13 degrees outside with our wood-fired stove, and I'm like, hey, and everybody else is just sort of like, yeah, dad, okay. Like, read <laughs> But we book. spend a lot of, we have, we do spend a lot of time just sitting in front of the fire together. Right chatting or yeah. hanging out with our kids and that is pretty regular i think we're pretty good at that and i think when you talk about like when we have to sometimes we're talking about the business and drawing the lines there's kind of two sides to it there's because a lot of times it's there's the negative and the positive positive. and the positive being like oh my gosh this person wrote to us and they have this bottle of wine and they want to get some more or this distributor from so you know New Mexico just got in touch with us and they're super excited about the wine. So that makes you feel you know you want to share that with your partner and be like, look, right. there the people are are enjoying what we're doing and want to want to be a, on, along for the ride. And you know, and then there's sometimes the negative things where you're just like, I just spent three days building the Missouri you know compliance stuff and then they canceled it on me. Now I've got a whole nother week in front of you know these <laughs> right. where you're just like I'm pulling out my hair. Right, right. So there's the the negatives and the positives. Um so they kind of balance each other out. But yeah, they're they're uh, I think in the beginning of this whole journey, you know, we used to be more sort of toe to toe figuring out like how we're even going to get it started and now we're like in we're the deep middle in the we're deep in the logistics of it now <laughs> that is very yeah. true it's gone through cycles where in the beginning there was so much conversation about where what it might be yeah and that's really exciting to start those conversations so and of course exciting. the entire time that we've had 100 sons grant has always had a day job right. and so ultimately the only time we do have, I mean, you know, really to have these conversations has been in the edges of the workday. So it is at night and on the weekends that we're doing a lot of the work, just mental work and seller work oh, yeah. here. Yep. You yeah. know, forever, it's bottling dates are always on the weekends because that's when grants are around. Um, and, yep. and just sort of, you know, stuff like that. And so I don't even know where I was going with that, but. Yeah, no, it's good that the two of you can, like, sit down and just chill and, like, enjoy each other's companies. Yeah, oh, yeah. Right. not as often as we would like, but someday. We're getting there. Yeah. I feel like we're getting closer to finding that balance. Um, we yeah. are. But we also yeah. run the risk of, two. you know, there's a lot of engagements that happen with this industry. Oh, yeah. Whether you're traveling for work, um, you know, presenting your wines in other states or, or countries or whatever. Uh, and then dinners and all that stuff. And, you know, some of them are very fun. Some of them are far away and take more away from you. Um, but at the at the end of the day, it, there's a lot of demands. And so one of the big things is, is trying to, to legitimately, you know, balance that out with the kids and make sure that, you know, we're not just like, okay, guys, like box of macaroni and cheese. We got to go down to this thing. And so we, we have become more aware of that and that's that's it's important to balance that piece out it is very important yeah yeah, yeah. and kind of on that number i mean so your mom was an english teacher mm -hmm. you were an english teacher is there any future of like your kids being an english teacher i don't think so i think the buck stops here <laughs> ty, <laughs> ty is pretty good at, at language arts i think he wants to do engineering stuff quincy likes to write um you know, I think she's more the more he's definitely like the the computers engineering sort right. of STEM. He's in a STEM program. She's a more of the sort of artistic. She loves to write and paint and music and dance she wine and, and dance. Yeah. You know, fun, and so fun. she's she's got a little bit more of that and he's got a little bit more of that. And there's overlap, of course, with both of them. But I don't. I think that the English teaching is likely to stop here. But we're, you know, you never know. Maybe there's right. a winemaker in our midst. I would more likely see one of them being a veterinarian. Because my dad was a veterinarian. And, the, right. and then, you know, I think sometimes these things skip a generation. Because <laughs> I saw how hard and how 
just how hard my dad worked and and it wasn't the most glorious of all jobs right um but you know then as a grant oh my god that must have been so amazing so maybe because they we have a dog and they just absolutely adore this dog so who knows maybe that could be in the future it is true when we talked to them jokingly we're always joking with them obviously if they if neither of them care about wine we'll be totally fine with that right but at one point we were we were asking our son like what do you think you want to take over 100 sons someday and he was like god no you guys work (laughs) way too hard right and we were like fair enough yeah fair enough (laughs) we work pretty hard you got to be able to do it you got to be able to do it you got to be willing to and love it yeah Yeah. because if you don't love it then it's yeah yeah, it's not worth it that's got to be hard yeah and that is, it is, uh, it is so gratifying to start something from the ground up and, and, you know, now going into eight years and like having people follow us and continue to purchase the wines and enjoy them and, and tell us, they, I mean, that's, that's amazing. You know, when we were first starting that, that's the dream, right? but you don't, you don't know where your dream will go. And now we're in the middle of it. And sometimes you have to take a a hot minute just to sit back and be like, wow, okay, this is, even though we're working hard, it's paying off and it's, it's an amazing ride. Yeah, it it is. Um, In the spring of 21, I was trying to compose a, uh, a writing piece for Janice Robinson's uh, yearly writing competition. Uh Uh-huh. And I came upon the Bednarak. Am am I saying that? Bednarik? We say Bednarik, but who really knows? I don't know. All right. You know. So I'll say Bednarik. Yeah. I came upon the Bednarik Vineyard. Uh, and I don't know if you remember, but you and I had a mm-hmm. Zoom session. Yep. It was April yep. 14th, 2021. Uh-huh. And I loved how you, when you first came upon the vineyard and just seeing it, you were just kind of blown away by how it looked and everything. How, yeah. How did you like come upon that vineyard? Well, it came through the Mora family. So um, when I was at Beaufrere, um, there was the, the Mora family that helped farm it. So they did a lot of the handwork in the vineyard. So right. from pruning to pulling, tying, all the things in between. So um, it was Oni, Valentine, and Chewy, the three brothers. Mm-hmm. And, and they had a sister as well that worked in, two sisters that worked in the vineyard as well. Um, and so... Um, they left and, and kind of went off on their own around 2015 or so. And they started leasing properties, farming them, and then selling the fruit. Uh, and so somehow, and I don't know how, they met William Bednarik, uh, and they were helping him with the farming. And he was, he was getting into his uh, 70s and had some health issues. But, mm-hmm. And then eventually, they, he, when he got sick and eventually passed away, then they took over full kind of lease and farming of the vineyard and but in 16 Oni called me up and said hey look I've got this vineyard um called Bednarik and it's out near Cherry Grove Oregon and um do you want are you looking for any fruit and I said look no I mean we're we're pretty full up and our you know our bank account's pretty low but it was really (laughs) early days it was yeah we started in 15 right and we were making 450 cases and so Bednarik we came we brought that on in 16 so we hadn't sold anything yet yeah we were at the point where we were just outputting right right and so I'm sure that I was like what yeah and and I went out and checked it out and it was we didn't buy a lot but I I could tell you know like okay this is an old vineyard for Oregon it's own rooted it looked like it was in really good condition Uh, it, it just seemed like a real diamond in the rough and I know that uh, Panther Creek had worked with it in the past um, and made some some pretty nice. Uh, I hadn't had any at the time, but some I'd heard some very nice single vineyards off of it. So, see, this is really cool. this is the kind of stuff I like. Right, you know, of finding course. this this cool gem. You're but, also like a big feeling guy. Like you get onto a site and you're just like, this feels right. I mean, I part of that yeah. is scientific. And you're yeah. in the back of your head, you're like, the aspect is right. The temperature feels good. Like yeah. you're thinking about all the things. But you also sometimes talk about the feelings that you get when you're standing on a vineyard. And when you came back from that vineyard visit, you were like on fire. Yeah. Yeah. I just remember being like, okay, there's, we are going to obviously be getting this fruit. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we got a little bit of fruit that first year. Um, and then we, we've gotten more sequentially over the years. And it is a really special site. And it always 
never ceases to kind of amaze me. It really is somebody who, people who love more delicate Pinot Noirs, who like more floral Pinot Noirs, that, that comes from that site. Um, right. It's never particularly powerful in terms of its weight or fruit profile, but it's, you know, it, it, there's a lot of mystery kind of woven into that wine. And, and every time we open a bottle, I'm always, even when I was like, like even the 19s, you know, we put them in a bottle. I was like, okay, that was a really nice bottle. You know, it was light and fresh and I really enjoyed it. And then we opened a bottle maybe, I don't know, maybe two months ago and it, I, it floored me. I was like, it put on weight and the fruit was so much more broad and it was so pure. And I was just like, oh my God, this may be the best bottle of wine that we've ever made. You know, at that, that you night. You literally said that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that night. And that was that I, mean, I think this is it. And it was, it was, when it went into bottle, I was like, yeah, that's a, you know, 90 point wine right there. And, and I'm like, that's 100 points. You know? <laughs> of course. In my head. Yeah. Yes, yes. But anyways, like, yeah, it's, it, it's a, it's a pretty awesome site. Yeah. No, I, just, I, I vividly remember that conversation. And again, thank you for taking the time. Oh, that day. of course. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I love it when people take a, a unique interest in site. And it, there's a lot of single vineyards. Um, I, when I worked in California, I remember when I was at Testarossa, they were making so many single vineyard sites. And they were all really good. There's certain ones that were in certain areas. And I remember they tasted very similar. Or I would go to... I would go to Sonoma and I would taste at wineries and there would be 15 single vineyards and they all kind of taste the same. And, right. But they were really good. But here, I, I really find such amazing um, vintage and site variation. That is really mm -hmm. the beauty of Oregon is you can just be like, wow, I want to follow that site, not just from not just from 100 Sons, but you know Martin Woods or Project M or whatever. Like All are making incredible Bednarics. They show the signature of that place. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that is cool. Yeah. I think that's an advantage, too. I mean, part of it would be great if we were gazillionaires and had the money to buy a huge hmm. estate vineyard somewhere. Yeah. But because we don't have a huge estate, we have, you know, three tiny acres that are under new vines now. They were old vine pinot that we ended up pulling out because it was phylloxerated. But, you know, because we only own a tiny bit of dirt, it allows us to go and source fruit from all of these different vineyards in all of the different sub ABAs here in the valley. And that has been really gratifying for us. I don't think we would ever want to stop doing that. And people ask all the time too, well, what's the difference between the wines that you were making at Beaufrere, the way you were making the wines or the wines that you're making for Flaneur versus what you're doing at Hundred Sons? And it's not that our practice is very different. I mean, some things that we're more, yeah. maybe a little more experimental here in some ways. Because, you know, it's us, if we, you know, if we screw something up or don't like something, we have, we don't feel guilty about it. It's ours to lose. Yeah. But there is a, there is a real benefit to being able to source from all of these incredible sites that are scattered all over the valley. Yeah. And you have a ton of stories to go with them yeah. as well. Yeah. It is really fun. And there is something to getting to know an estate. And, you know, I think of a Beaufrere or a Brick House and they're mostly working with a, one particular site and getting to know it and there is the the year-to-year -year story that you tell and the farming and and just the true intimacy that you grow with the site you know but in burgundy there's you know oftentimes domains that have you know multiple vineyards that they're sourcing from all over you know north and south and some of them are five rows of this and three of that and they're in, yeah. you know they're in they're in different zones and they're on different you know bits of soil and and it's not dissimilar from that where we get to work with all these different terroirs and i i've learned a lot i really have like I suppose when I was at Beaufrere, we were definitely working with different vineyards, Grand Moraine, Zena Crown. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked with Carabella, Shea, all these, a lot of different things that went into the Willamette Valley wine usually. And then we did do some single vineyards as well. So I did get to kind of like um, scratch that outer itch of like, oh, what's the Yola Hills about? Or what's the Yamhill Carlton about? Right, right. But with us, like we've been able to work with some pretty incredible sites and, you know, like we... Like I'll use, we have the Carson Phillips Vineyard, which we're working with in the Dundee Hills. And I think of it as very classic. You know, it's basalt-based soils, uh, deep jewelry. You get this like 
very rich but sort of red fruit in that sort of raspberry cranberry it is just absolute it's joy so to drink um and then we have this other vineyard lone feather that we're working with now this is our second vineyard second vintage of working with the pinot we haven't released any yet but it's old vine own rooted as well planted right around the same time that bednarik was but it's in very rocky basalt soils mm. um, in the McMinnville AVA. So it's actually in the town. It's it's in Sherwood, but it's in the McMinnville AVA. Sheridan. Sheridan, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Um, and, but you couldn't, Bednarik and Lone Feather are yeah, really completely different. different. The Lone Feather is dark and brooding. And in 23, it's like, it has incredible acidity, natural acidity. It's like, you know, pH of 3.3 on a finished, um, you know, Pinot Noir, but so much richness mm -hmm. and incredible depth. It's just like, it's a skyscraper of a wine. Right. And, but it's, you, you know, you bring this fruit in, tiny little clusters, scraggly, and it made this incredible wine, both in 22 and 23. So, you know, you've got basalt soils in two different areas, and they're so, they have similarities, but so different. And that's, that is a, that's really fun and it's taking me a long time to learn areas and for us to like understand what what's what we like and what's, those are going to be really fun side by sides yeah. to taste bednarik and lone feather yeah. together like with people going forward because they are both so old you know organ old yeah organ um, old that's the way of putting it <laughs> yeah like they're that. they yeah. are they're organ old i mean yeah. some of the older ones and so and then there we have a bottling that kind of joins forces um, from all of our own rooted vineyards. And so we get to take those favorite barrels that we have of all of our own rooted sites and we put together a very small special cuvee for that. So there's, it's fun to taste them in their own right. And right. then also really interesting to see what happens when you take both of those profiles that Grant was talking about and then you get to kind of incorporate them. It's a whole different kind of beautiful. So. It really it be is. Beautiful. Yeah. So I have a, like a random question that I always ask couples when they're mm -hmm. side by side. Um, if you want to say no, I don't want to answer. It's totally <laughs> fine. Uh, but the question is, and I'll start with you, Renee. I okay. want to ask you the same question. It's the middle of the night, and you get a phone call, and it's Grant mm -hmm. on the other end of the phone. Okay. He's in jail. Okay. What crime has he committed? Oh, wow. <laughs> God, you're so straight and narrow. It's really, really hard for me to imagine you being in jail for anything. Drunk in public? <laughs> Probably. Yeah, I mean, that would be the no, most. No, but you're yeah. not really a big drinker no. like that either. Oh, let me think about that. Maybe um, surfing after hours when he's not uh, supposed to be? I, no, I don't think you can get locked up for that. Okay. I mean, it's really hard. You are such a, you are very, you're a, a law-abiding kind of guy. Like, you're a, de you're a good person and a, de and, a, and a good citizen. I'm just trying to think about all of the things. Because you're not, you're not so much a risk taker outside the lines like that. You're, you're a huge risk taker in, you're very entrepreneurial and you have no fear about going forward because you have confidence in what you do. And so you're very risk takery in that way. But in other ways, you're not. But why You're am like, I in jail? Tax fraud? What did what I do God. here? <laughs> um, I, mean, so, I don't know. Come back to me. I got to think about that. Okay. I mean, when I first started asking these questions, the first time I asked it, the the wife was like, murder. And I'm like, oh, damn. Wow. And then, God, you know, yeah. there's yeah. been arson and baby stealing. And then other people have been like, ah, uh, mountain biking on private property. Mm -hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now your turn, Grant. It's um, the middle of the night. What middle of the night. Middle of the night. You're middle of the night, and Renee is in jail. Yeah. Um, and there's no walkable coffee in. Yeah. Anywhere. Right. Right. Yeah, I think I think that you've broken. fallen asleep in a public place that you're not supposed to be. Okay. Maybe. So trespassing style, like found a bench, exhausted, couldn't get home, fell asleep. Well, we like to play this game sometimes in our when we drive. I drive the kids to school. Um, okay, and it's we give three items, um, 
and so like a squid, a pen, and a ball of twine. Okay. And then we'll say like, okay, are you going to be the robber or the thief? Um, and you know, so the kids will say, okay, I'm going to be the robber. And I'm like, okay, what you have to do is somebody has a golden statue of a kitten, and you have to use those three items, and then you have to come up with the the story of how you're you know stealing this item. So where is this going? I well, have no uh, idea. I, I, I can only think of making up a story. Because I can't think of any reason why you would be in jail. <laughs> we are so boring. <laughs> I, uh, well, I think it would have something to do with my driving. Yeah, I'm not a very you good are driver. Very fast. I'm She's like a, a way too really fast, fast driver. Fast driver. My problem, I would probably be in jail for going too, too slow. Too slow. Yeah, I thought I, of that, but I was like, they wouldn't I put drive, you in jail for that. And I'm, as Renee likes to call it, I. I bagok. Oh so, gosh. so when it's I'm driving, I'm like, I cannot be in a car with. Oh, I'm looking all around. <laughs> it's infuriating, especially when I, when we're in like wine country, oh. and I'm just like, pull, so I probably would, you know, I would have like pulled into a ditch, and okay. you know, and gone. trying to see, you're trying to see what's happening in a vineyard as you're driving by, and like ran a car off the road, and they might be driving related because otherwise, I think we're pretty law law abiding folks. Yeah, but I, you know, I w- maybe would be going too fast, but you would definitely be off the road, maybe into another car, bagocking to see what how much verasion has occurred <laughs> in the middle of the trying to see. And for you, I think that you would be in jail because um, you went for a work trip to Missouri uh, and you actually didn't realize that there was a warrant out for your arrest for tax fraud because you didn't know it. Because you just hadn't paid the taxes on the Missouri state license. It all license. comes back to my inability to do compliance well. I think that's what he's saying, and I own that 100%. And then they would throw you in jail, and they'd be like, you owe like five years of back taxes. That's, prob- that's, that's possible. But um, that's about, I think that's where okay. we would be. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Well, I have some rapid fire questions. Okay. Uh-oh. I'll reveal the wine, and I'll get you out of here. Okay. 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 Uh, favorite artist to listen to during harvest? I know you like jazz. I do like jazz. Um, I'm, I guess I'm pretty generic. I love Miles Davis. Um, th- you know, his kind of blue album is a very calming thing for me. Right. So when I come in, like in the morning, like if, especially if I'm by my uh, myself, it's usually like super, super mellow. I would say the other one is a, is a, um, he is a jazz trumpeter. His name is Matthew Halzal. I think he's Canadian, uh, but like extremely like ethereal and super like just balances me out. So if I'm ever stressed, um, he he's got a couple albums that are pretty incredible. So I would say Miles Davis, Matthew Halzal, and then it like moves later on in the day. You know, I, then I kind of move into sort of like classic 90s hip hop, which is always, everybody has fun with that. Of course. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's true. We do, we do listen to a lot of 90s hip hop in here. I think oh, yeah. my, when I'm in charge of the DJing, right. I, I mean, it's kind of, it syncs up because there's an age difference. I kind of grew up in the, in the 80s and he grew up in the 90s. <laughs> and so <laughs> as is just true for so many people, we sort of get stuck where we were in high school. I really and so I am stuck 80s, solidly so. in the 80s. And so if I'm at bat, it's general definitely public. like, yeah, some like 80s, yeah, general public and English beat yep. and like the cure. The and wooden tops. The, <laughs> the wooden tops. <laughs> Obscure 80s band. <laughs> the, the. Yep. Like those are my, those are my go-tos in Harvest. Yeah. I like it to be really high energy during yeah. Harvest. Right. Like there are times when we're just doing punch downs and like morning work where we're, we'll start and it's jet. But if we're on the processing line, I got to be hyped up. Oh yeah, you don't want Miles Davis. Oh no, no. mama. Uh-uh. Yeah, you got to be. Yeah, like, yeah. Mama needs jams. Yeah. Like that's where the '90s hip hop comes in. Or good, or, good like, '80s jam. Um, you know, put like Prince on or something. Yeah, there like you that. go. Yeah, there you go. Yep. Very nice. Favorite indulgent food. Mm. Oh. Oh god, it's so depressing. Because oh, wait, I, wait, 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 let me. Can I guess? <laughs> can I try and guess? Yes. I would say you're like the number one. Like it's it would be chocolate malted crunch. 
uh, <laughs> from the Thrifty's ice cream. Okay, that is very high up there. Yes. Yeah. That is that is definitely. But what a were you gonna say? Well, I I mean like I just love any I like love like oh, a sweet. pasta carbonara oh. or like a fettuccine alfredo. I love carbs and cream sauce okay. any day of the week. Is yours pizza? Your mm. indulgent food? Just cheese in general. Like, cheese is my desert. Like, I love cheese more than anything. Like, but you I, allow like, yourself to eat cheese. I do. You I don't do allow cheese. yourself to eat a lot of pizza. I guess though. indulgent. I don't eat a lot of pizza, but that's my favorite. I but love your pizza. your jam. Yes. I love pizza. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, if you could choose a superpower, what would it be? Mm. Oh, definitely move objects with my mind because it would make moving barrels so much easier. So much Just easier. Whoop. <laughs> yeah, that would be. Oh, there you go. Yep. Mine yep. would be to understand accounting. Is that a superpower? To <laughs> yes, me, it, it seems is. Like it yes, is. Yeah. yes, that is a superpower. Uh, harvest notes are they digital or handwritten? <laughs> Wait, you're supposed to take harvest yeah. notes? Oh, I don't know. Maybe you, I mean some people. They're <laughs> <laughs> not even written. They're all. Up They're there. all on a piece of painter's tape on the barrels. Okay. That's kind of where the harvest notes are. Harvest notes, they're or on placards. We do have that placards, and then we stuff them away. And y you were for a long time pretty good about putting harvest data back in, but I digitize them eventually. Like I try to. I'm a, I'm a vintage or two behind right now. I, but you know what? I really to that note though. I remember at Beaufort, one of my jobs was to keep a log, like a daily log. Right. So every day, or you know, if it was a week, sometimes I'd condense it into a week or harvest. I wouldn't do it all every day, but like we had log books of we called the lab books. So it had all of our you know analysis from from harvest and sugar bricks and all that stuff, and then we would have notes. And so you know, for my nine years there, I, I, every day I wrote something down. And then before me, Steve Goff, and then James Cahill, and and then Mike Getzel himself. Right. And so we had this huge, like, tome of all the just randoms. And it would be like, you know, Rahelio and Grant pruned in the upper terrace today, and we tasted through barrels, and barrel number 55 was The point being, received. we do not do that anymore. Yeah, but I wish that right. I, 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 should, I need to we do not have the time. We, we don't have the time to take copious notes on things. No. But we do keep notes on each fermenter and then on barrels, and then those those fermenter notes get transferred digitally but other than that it, the data you are so intuitive about the way that you make wine and so that is also part of it is that it's not super lab heavy it's not like you're running juice panels to decide how to ferment things you're tasting no. things and smelling things and a lot of the practice I think is like that actually I mean you do do you know we do send things to the lab when of we course. need to but it's very sensorily driven yeah and I, I always talk about you know, sometimes, you know, people are so, they're looking at numbers, you know, and you forget to, you know, it says it's red, it says it's doing this, and then you look up and you're like, that's not doing that. You know, you gotta, you gotta look at the patient and see right. what's going on and feel the heartbeat. So we, we're not, we're not very tech heavy in terms, we do look at sort of what I call the heartbeat of the wine, which is, you know, the, the acid levels and the sugar, sugar levels. Right. Um, but in terms of, you learn from certain vineyards over time, like that's going to be a nutrient deprived vineyard. That one's not going to ferment. You know, that then one's going to come in with a really high pH. Yeah. This is going to come and in. And so you, right. you have that to, to kind of, um, and that usually takes about three years of working with a vineyard to start to understand that. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, last book you read. It could be Audible. It could be a podcast. It could be anything. I know that you're busy, so trying to actually read a book is, can be difficult. I just read a book called The Midnight Library. Okay. I can't remember what the, who the author is. Our neighbor gave it to me, and it was wonderful. It was sort of a um, alternate reality, time-bending escapism with a Ooh. with a uh, great message about the way to live your life. That sounds. Fun. It was actually it was it was a great read. Okay. I liked it. All right. It's been a long time. Since you're, reading, you're reading. You're <laughs> reading. I'm, re I'm in the middle of a book right okay, now. Okay, what are you in the middle of reading? What's it called? It's called Fourth Wing. Fourth Wing. Oh, did you? That's like the second book. You know, it's, it's the first, first okay, one. Okay, it's the first. Well, because they, so Ty read it, our son read it first, and then he was just like, ah, 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 and then she read it, and so there, and then I was like, I really want to read this too. And so I'm in the middle of it, but they can't not talk about right. it. But I'm like, hold off, don't talk about it until I get through it. So they're kind of waiting. I might have loose lipped a couple details that I shouldn't but, have. But yeah. it's okay. 
yeah. anyhow. You're so going to still enjoy it. That's what I'm in the middle of right now. And um, and then a friend of mine gave me a, a book about the poisoning of DRC. So that's my next on my nightstand. Uh, nice. Yeah. yeah. No, I gave the fourth, fourth wing to my daughter for uh, Christmas. Oh, you did. Because I heard, you know, it's like one of those books that you start reading. You yeah, can't put yeah, it down. Yeah. And, you know, I heard that it's very sexy. Oh, yeah. I haven't There's gotten the, there yet. Okay. There was there were there were some definite parts where I had to explain some things to my fourteen year old. We got out some biology, you know. Right. We we got we went on the interweb to look at some diagrams. <laughs> that was, that was over like, Christmas vacation. Oh my god! I can't believe I'm doing this right now. Oh, but, yeah. oh my goodness! It was hilarious. <laughs> That's awesome. I loved the conversations because you guys had both read, and I was like, okay, well, I got to read this thing now. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right, shall I reveal what the wine was? Oh, please okay. do. I think it's okay. older than when I originally thought. I said 13. Uh, wait, hold on. Let me... Okay. I'm going... Okay, I'm going to move away from uh, Evesham Wood, and I'm going to say Adelsheim. I don't know why. Because it tastes like an Adelsheim. Okay. So, it's a loose connection here. Okay. Um, when you came up, to interview with Eric Homaker. Mm -hmm. uh, Erica from Walter Scott gave you a bunch of directions and stuff down. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. She was working yeah. at the right. Baby Bistro. Yes. Right. So I brought a Walter oh, Scott wow. Gamay. Oh, it's Gamay. You were right. 19 Gamay. Oh, my God. You were right about that. You were all over it. You got that. Wow, unbelievable. So can you said we had editing power on this? Yeah, that's <laughs> all, all that the discussion about what, what we were I talking about. Write. Wow, that's, <laughs> that is great. Yep. That makes uh, me want to go and open some other 19 Gamays. Well, uh, I've never I, had that. And then, I went, and then I went to Shayla Mountains with uh, with Adelsheim, so I'm feeling that's more That's practically oh, right yeah, across the street. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Wow. Well, I was way off on that. Yeah. But... That's delicious. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's all the questions that I have. Do you got any questions or comments for me before we wrap up? Um, no, just... Okay. What are the through lines for you as you've sat with people um, from, you know, the, the valley? Are there any things that just sort of to you seem like common echoes in people's stories or experiences? Oh, boy. That is something that I haven't really thought See, about. See, it's hard being on the other side. It is hard to be on the other <laughs> side. No, it, you know, is and I'm... Is right uh, No, I think, it, I think it's turned off now. Yeah. <laughs> Through lines, I mean, there is uh, a lot of hard work that goes into everything that you do. And one of the things that I try to show is that, yes, there's a lot of hard work. And in general, we kind of put winemakers up on this pedestal of like... They're gods, but y'all are just normal people, and I really want people to see that. And you know, so as far as as far as a through line is, these are humans, mm -hmm. and everybody over here is just a human doing the best that they can in this life that we have. Yeah, yeah. It takes a lot of hard work. Yeah, I think sure. I think that is a one of the the distillations of everything we do at the end of the day and i try and you know if i'm like up in front of a group and i'm talking or i'm at a more intimate wine dinner i say like at the end of the day like you know we're hoping that you will buy our bottle of wine and take it home and enjoy it at what is probably one of the most precious moments of your day right you know and and for certain people absolutely 100 percent. you know the food and the wine is the most precious point because you you work your day, you work hard, and then at the end of the day, the moment that you're able to, you know, pull that cork and have that food, and it doesn't have to be extraordinary food, it doesn't even have to be an extraordinary wine, but if it's our wine, it's on your table, and we're sh we're like kind of at the table with you. Yeah. And that's pretty special and a little voyeuristic in a way because we are like at the moment, you know, there may be a conversation. And also we put little cameras in our bottles yeah. so that we can actually see what your reaction is. It's getting really expensive to bottle. Yeah. I can only imagine. Yeah. Jeez. But that, that to me is when you kind of extend yourself all the way forward into the line and then just think about it, you know, maybe somebody opens it many, many years later. 
yeah. and they're with people who who've never heard of you, and they're drinking a bottle of your wine. Um, it's special in a very unique way. What there's very few food products or or things in general. There's tangible items, I suppose. You, know, you could hand somebody, you know, your grandfather's war medal or something like that. But this is something that you actually imbibe, which is and and shows a place and time and the people who made it. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, I appreciate your time, and this has been a great, so fun. great time. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks right. for sitting down with us. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining me on this flavorful voyage through the world of wine on the Wine Notes podcast. I've been your host and guide, AJ Winesettle, and it's been an absolute pleasure sharing these captivating stories with you. But alas, like the last sip of a fine vintage, our time together must end. But don't fret, my wine-loving friend. The cellar doors of the Wine Notes podcast will always remain open, waiting for you to return and explore new conversations, stories, and musings from the captivating people behind the magical world of wine. Before you go, hit that subscribe button on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify, and don't forget to leave a sparkling five-star review to help spread the word. Until our glasses clink again, remember to savor life's moments and let the spirit of wine and camaraderie linger on your palate. Cheers, and as always, may your wine glass be full, your heart be light, and your journey be delightful. Thank you again.